the sins of the world. Why don't you lift your hands even now? Thank you, Jesus. You are God. We give you a place as God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, we honor you. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, we honor you. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. Thank you, Holy Ghost. It's such an honor to worship you. It's such an honor to bring the sacrifice of our lips, to bring the sacrifice of ourselves. It's an honor and a privilege. Thank you, Lord. We glorify you. We honor you. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We're going to look at a few things in the scripture because we have, I think, two programs immediately after this, the benevolent service and um, the men meeting. So we're just going to be done in another 30 minutes. But I want to take a look at something, the symptoms of an ineffective encounter. A lot of times we've been coming here to cry out, oh God, give me an encounter and all of that. But do you know that there are ineffective encounters and there are effective encounters? I notice. Walk, having walking with God, having been walk, walked with people, having been um, a person who desires a lot to have a Christianity that has God in it. Because there are Christianity that doesn't have God in it. There are um, Christianity that are just mouth based. Nothing is going on. No experience. No deep encounter with the Lord. No deep intimacy with the Lord. Having been a person who has been focused on all of that, I see and I basically have seen that people experience two types. They are ineffective encounters and they are effective encounters. And most of the time, people have ineffective encounters because when they are looking for a counter, they are really looking for something supernatural to happen. And I see that after all the supernatural things, quote unquote, happens, that's where it ends. There's always something that God has in mind whenever the Lord wants to give a man or a woman an encounter. Whenever God comes to make himself real to a man or a woman or a people or a nation or whatever it is, there's something that God always has in mind. And when you don't know the end, when you don't know what it is that God has in mind, you miss out on what it is that God is doing. Sometimes people come and God highlights a word or brings a word to their understanding and then I see those people leave the meeting I say oh other people fell and I didn't fall oh fire fell on people's hand and I didn't fall in their mind they think that it is the fire or the falling that is the encounter that is not it most of the time what that's just God heightening to make you know that he's real after you have now known that God is real what next so what most people have had for years is what God calls an ineffective or let me put it on that way, an unproductive encounter with the Lord. I'll give you an example of a, a perfect person. I'll take one from the old and try to do one from the new and then we're going to pray. So let's look at um, Genesis 47 verse 7. I want us to do quickly so that you would know we'll just run through this very quickly and then we're going to pray. Then you now know what to look out for. You know what to look out for. When you go to pray, when you go to meetings, when you go to sessions, you know what to look out for. If you don't know what to look out for, that thing that God has sent to you will pass and you still not get it. So the Bible says to us in Genesis 47, we read from um, 7 to about 9. It said, then Joseph brought his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh. The background to this story is Joseph had been sent ahead of time by God and sent him to go to Israel. Um, sorry, Egypt. Uh, he went as a slave. And at the end of the day, he became the prime minister of Egypt and he sent for his family. His family eventually came with their father, Jacob. And ascending and descending. And a lot of great things happened in the life of Jacob in terms of encounter. Jacob was a guy that collected the patriarchal blessing. So God began a walk and he started that walk with Abraham. The same work he's doing in our lives today. He started a walk with Abraham. Abraham passed it on to Isaac, and then there was a Jacob and um, there was a Jacob and his saw dilemma. And Jacob, at that time, having the heart for God, which is where most people are, that's just the beginning. That is not the end. Jacob having a heart for God and a desire for spiritual things, which is where most people are, but that is not the end. He had a heart for God, had a desire for God. I know that because. Um, you know, when he, his brother, he was looking for an opportunity to get all that he could get from God. 
And so when his brother came home that day hungry and said, give me food, Jacob saw it as an opportunity to get all that his heart had always wanted. Because the truth is that God will give you an opportunity for all your heart has ever wanted in God. But a lot of times when we see the opportunity, we miss out on it because we don't even recognize what it is. So Jacob was able to cash in on that opportunity and say, okay, you know what? I, I want the best right in exchange. And um, that exchange happened because words are not just words. Words are covenant based. So the moment Esau opened his mouth and said, okay, well, I don't care about my birthright. The reason he made that comment is because he didn't understand what it meant to carry the patriarchal blessings. He didn't know what it meant. He didn't see the superior value in the kingdom. So when there was that exchange between go, go for God or go for the today, he obviously immediately without any thought uh, in it, he was not able to discern that this was a test and he handed over his birthright by his words. And so when it was time for the father to lay his hands uh, on the guy that had the betrayal, whose name was actually Esau, um, that didn't happen. Jacob went ahead. And I believe that God wanted the mother to hear that exchange because Esau had already handed over the betrayal. He had no right to go and collect it again. So I believe that God was behind the mother overhearing the conversation and calling Jacob and saying, go, do this, do this, do this. And he went and he was able to get the betrayal. I didn't say it was God that said go and deceive. I said it was God that made the woman to hear what the father was telling the son. Anyhow, Jacob now gets the bet right, first of all. He now takes a journey. He has an encounter with the Lord. God opens his eyes. He saw the angels ascending and descending. After that, you know, um, different encounter. He went to the well. He went back to bed and had another encounter. Got several encounters. But this is not the end of Jacob's life or the beginning of the last phase of his life. He's brought before Pharaoh the king of Egypt and then the Bible says and Joseph set Jacob before him meaning at this time Jacob could not really walk on his own he couldn't stand on his own so he had to be set before Pharaoh he had to be lifted you know how someone is now weak you now carry him and put him before Pharaoh and the Bible says then Joseph brought his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh and Jacob blessed Pharaoh Okay, verse 8. I wanted to make a comment on this, but you will take me too far. Okay, so 8. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, um, how old are you? My thought process is, if you see your, the prime minister's um, uh, father, your, your first question will not be, how old are you? I'll probably ask something more in the light of, oh, how are you doing? I'm glad to see you. Wow, you're the father of, of, um, of Jacob. But his question is strange. He said, how old are you? You know why he asked how old he was? Because the guy was looking strange in his eyes. He must have been looking too old for being Jacob's father. It's just like I see somebody with a grandchild. My question is, how old are you exactly? How are you having this person as your grandchild? You know, as you know, you understand what I mean? So he looked at him and he said, and now let's look at verse 9. And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days, this is so this is how Jacob summarized his existence. The days of, of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been, have they been the days of the years of my life. They have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the age of their pilgrimage. So this is what Jacob was saying. The summary of my entire life is that my days have been few and they have been evil. Now, this is not how I expect somebody who has had all those type of encounters with God, who God has a great plan for. This is not how I expect him to summarize his 130 years. So the 130 years journey with God, this is how it's summarized that there have been evil days, that there have been few, but there have been evil days. And you know, some of us are might at the end of our lifetime, or even as it is today, summarize our work with God like this. This is a man who has had several encounters, eight major encounters with God. But I call Jacob the man who had multiple ineffective encounters with God. He did all that prayer, but it was ineffective. Why? I'm not expecting him to summarize his life like, but he was not lying. But do you know one of the reasons why encounters with the Lord are ineffective? Most of the encounters have in the body of Christ are ineffective. I know that because of where Christianity has, is today. So let's see part of the reasons why Jacob had an ineffective encounter with God. Let's take a look at um, Genesis 31 verse 41. I'll tell you why. Okay. 
thus I have been in your house 20 years. So, 20 years time. And when was this house happening? It was immediately after he had collected the birthright. He went on a journey. And when he went on that journey, the Bible says he dreamt, he, he dreamt and he saw the angels ascending and all of that. He had an encounter with God. And immediately after the encounter, the next chapter, this is verse 28. I'm trying to jump so that I'll be fast. You see in 28, that was when he went to that um, place. And he had an encounter and all that. He now went to Laban's house and co. But the Bible tells us something. Let's read from Genesis 31, 41. Okay, it's there. He said, thus, I have been in your house for 20 years. I'm trying to help you see what Jacob spent his life doing. I've been in your house for 20 years. Now, if you read the Bible, you find out that he came to this house immediately after he had had an encounter with several encounters with God. He says, so I've been in your house 20 years. This is what I did with my 20 years. I served 14 years for two daughters, seven for Rachel, another seven for Leah, and then six years for your flock. And then you have changed my wages 10 times. Okay, so I got lots and lots and lots of promotions 10 times. But then again, what did I spend my 20 years doing? And this 20 years was the prime of his life. This 20 years was when he should have begun a walk with God. But part of why Jacob responded that his days have been evil is what he spent his time on earth doing. So the moment he finished an encounter with God, what he did was to go and offer himself and say, I am going to serve for a woman for seven years. So my question to you today is, what exactly are you doing with your life? What are you serving for? For 20 years, Jacob wasted his life. Another 20 years before that, he had been in his house, basically learning, but not doing anything. So if you add these 20 years, because I was trying to analyze the whole of the 120 uh, or 30 years that Jacob had. Most of them were full of all kinds of trials and troubles. Do you know why? when the time after he had had an encounter with God there is something that God expected him to do immediately after it is not to go and serve tables it is not to go and serve for a woman or a man or whatever it is it is to go and begin to do what God had called him to do which he failed to realize so a lot of times you do a lot of prayer I'm telling you now that all the prayers were prayed for a period of time now at the end of the day if you don't do the right thing after this the prayers will be wasted at the end of the day you'll come and you're making a comment like Jacob what does God expect us to do how do you know your encounter has been ineffective three signs number one there is a change in my character and I can see significant change in my character Somebody called me early this morning and he says one of the things he has noticed is that he doesn't have any sort of offense anymore. He's looking for offense. And in fact, he looks at his life and he's saying to himself, this thing that used to offend me before, I can't see the offense in it. I'm even looking for people to offend me. There is no offense. That is a significant change in character. Not that you are guessing. You can actually see and pinpoint this is a change in character. That's one. Number two, you can see there's intimacy between you and God. The level of your work with God, the level of your intimacy, when you go to pray, the experiences there are different from how it used to be before. You and God, your intimate, you realize that every time you go to pray, you are right in the Holy of Holies with God. Now, what happens in the Holy of Holies is not what I can explain. It is what you, can, you have to experience by yourself. The desire for the lost will change. You have a fake encounter. If I don't see the evidence in souls, you have a fake encounter. You have an ineffective encounter. It doesn't, if you like, see two million angels, it's of no use to the kingdom if it does not produce results. If you like, see smoke everywhere, it does not produce results if I don't see the evidence in the souls, or at least in your now action towards the Lord. The truth is that every time you go to God, when you have an encounter with God, one thing you leave there with is a but the burden of the master. You will live there with the burden of Jesus. The, the burden of Jesus rests upon your heart. So you cannot have a deep walk with God. You can't say you have an effective encounter with God if it does not report in a change towards your attitude towards men or your attitude toward the lost. It is impossible. That's how you know your encounter has been ineffective. If it does, if I don't see you, yes, I had an encounter with the Lord. Okay, so every afternoon I'm going to be winning souls. I'm going to write a letter to all my friends. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then you actually start doing it. Your encounter is ineffective. 
So I'm going to end with this because I have so much to say, but I'm going to end with this. Principles of kingdom increase. You want increase? You want increase in anything that God is already doing in your life? I'm going to show you how to have that increase. It's not prayer. It, prayer is not the... Because I think what happens to us is, oh, we want this to increase. I'm going to tell you, if God has already put something in your hand and you want that thing to increase, I'll tell you exactly what to do. It's in the Bible. Let's take a look at Matthew 25. I'll give you two examples and then you're going to pray. Matthew 25 verse 15. And unto the one he gave five talents. And unto one he gave five talents. To another he gave two talents and all that. And to another... He gave to each one according to his several ability. And immediately he went about his journey. Now this verse of scripture tells us before he gave the man five talents, there was already something the man was doing. How do I know? The Bible says he gave according to their abilities, which means there was already something they were doing. So that means every single person came with something already to do for the Lord. Yeah? So he gave them according to their several abilities. So God didn't wake up and give Mr. X five talent because he liked Mr. X better. He gave Mr. X five talent because he already saw that with the ability Mr. X had, he was able to produce something that caused God to give him five talents. He saw that in the other person, the other person had an ability that he was already working on that caused God to give him two talents and one talent. So that's how he distributed the talent. Now let's take a look at verse 20, what happened and what he said. Verse 20 of the same Matthew 25. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. So let's jump to 28. So what did the guy with the five talents do? What did he do? What did he do? He multiplied. He saw already there are three levels. What was the first level? The first ability that you have. Second level, God now gave you five. Ten levels, you now made it ten. So see what he said in verse 28. This is how increase comes. So take the talent from him. That's the one that didn't use his talent well. And give it unto the one that has what? Ten talent. How did the guy increase the amount of talent he has? Who can tell me from this thing that we read? Who can tell me what the guy did for kingdom increase? To increase the anointing and all of that. What did the guy do? Yes, sir. Can you give him a mic so that it can be picked from any device we are listening from? There's one here. Is it on? He multiplied the one that uh, he was given to work on. Mm -hmm. And this showed to the master that he can be trusted with more. Simple. Very simple. There is a place for prayer in multiplication. Yes, I agree. But beyond the prayer for multiplication, there is the action part. In other words, use. If you are not using the one they've already given you, don't ask for more. You will not be given. If you like, pray for nothing next year. You will not be given. So simply multiply what God has given you. Use what God has given you. The, the revelation, you, are, you ask one more revelation. With the one that you have, what is the evidence of the one that you have? How are you using the one that you already have? If you want to be a ten talenter, use your five talents well. Use, put it into practice. The small anointing that you have, put it into practice. How did the healing ministry start? How do I get results with cancer? It's not that the first day I prayed for cancer. God, no, it was by praying for the first person that had headache. Use the ministry well. In the preaching one-on-one, -on -one, then you have capacity to preach to five. Then you have to preach to ten. Then you have to preach to one million. God doesn't jump. So with the little that you have, start. If you don't start using it, 300 years later, we're going to be here. And for every moment you delay, What's going on? You're going to end up, before you know what's happening, you've counted 130 years, you end up saying, my days have been few. Your time here on earth is to do nothing but to do what you have been called to do. Before you know what you have been called to do, the ones that are not revealed, start with the revealed will of God. I thought, I think sometime in January, before you start looking for the unknown will of God, start with the, the one you know. Start 
between the revealed will of God. There are four levels of God's will. There's what is called the revealed will. I don't want to go into all of that. I preached that message. I think that was the first uh, message I preached this year, 4th of January. There's already the revealed will. The one you know starts. By the time you're doing the one you know, then it will be multiplied. So the effect, the, the signs of an ineffective encounter. Number one, there is no change in your character. There is no change in your intimacy with God. That is number two. And how I know intimacy is you see that desire to come to church. You see the desire to pray. You see the desire to study. Number three, there is no change towards your drive, towards the loss. Are you sleeping and thinking, how am I going to get more souls? How am I going to impact this, my neighbor? How am I going to impact this person? How do I share flyers? What do I do? And then it will reflect in your prayer. Your prayers, you are now praying for the lost. Because you know you can't go before God empty-handed. I want us to talk to God along these lines of reaching out. If you let me tell you, if you go and stand before Jesus, eh, I, you don't have anything to present before Jesus, and you're telling God, "Well, for 20 years I served uh, for women. For another 20 years I was in my father's house. For another 20, I've done this and that." You are go, you will not make it to heaven. If you read verse 30, Matthew 25, verse 30, let's see 30, and then we're going to pray along these lines. I want to see. The impact of this. Verse 30 of Matthew 25. He said, cast the unprofitable servant. What does this mean? The guy is a servant, but he's unprofitable. The guy is a servant, but he's unprofitable. God is a businessman. He wants to see profit. When he's looking at your account, where's the profit? Where's the profit in terms of souls? Where's the profit in terms of life that are changed? Who can you bring and say, this one did not know the Lord. But today, because of this I've done, this I've done, my prayer, he now knows the Lord. Who would you say is undiscipled completely? Not that he's already in church. Because some of us go and take people that are already in church, who are already on the path. You say you are disciple. That's not what God is talking about. You're only aiding an ongoing discipleship already. The discipleship is already ongoing. Whose life has been touched and changed because of you? Which nation has been taught and changed because of you? That is what God is talking about. If not, you are an unprofitable servant. You are not making profit for the kingdom. You are not making profit. What is the result of unprofitable servanthood? Thrown into somewhere called what? Outer darkness. The Bible says in that place, there will be weeping and there will be gnashing of teeth. Hallelujah. But that will not be your portion because now that you have heard, you are going to make a plan. So what we, we, as you pray, you're going to bring out a sheet of paper and a pen by yourself or your notepad. You're going to write, what is my profitability plan for the kingdom for this week? We're going to pray. God to drop it in your spirit, man. That's what we're going to ask. As you pray, he'll drop it. What is my profitability plan for the kingdom for this week? And then after that, you're going to pray, what is my profitability plan for the month of October? We're stepping into the month of October. Three more months to go before 2020 ends. What is the profitability plan? What is the profitability plan? What is the profitability plan? So we're going to get up. We're going to pray. We're going to ask God, Lord, I don't want to be an unprofitable servant. Help me, Lord. So first of all, if you've been unprofitable, I think we we'll begin with repentance. I want you to stand and pray this prayer. Stand up. We're going to stand. We're going to ask God. If you know, you look at your own life, you have been unprofitable to the kingdom. So we start with repentance. Lord, I'm asking for mercy. You have been unprofitable. You have wasted the grace of God upon your life. You're going to begin by asking God, Lord, show me great mercy. Show me great mercy. Show me great mercy. Some of us are kingdom collectors. Eh? Kingdom collectors. Always going to God. Collect this. Collect grace. Collect anointing. Collect fire. Collect passion. Collect everything. Kingdom collectors. God is not looking for more kingdom collectors. He's looking for people who are bringing profit to the kingdom. The profit of lives change. The profit of souls. If not, you are a useless servant. Because the Bible says, cast that useless servant. If you look at some translations. He said, cast that useless servant. And Jesus was angry and upset. Tell God, I don't want to be a kingdom collector anymore. Always coming to collect. I want evidence, Lord. Ask him, Lord, please forgive me for being an unprofitable servant. I have not made profit. Imagine. The nine months have passed in 2020. Have you made profit? Have you made profit? Can you imagine remaining in a company and you're not making profit for that company? Do you think the MD will be happy with you? The answer is no. The answer is no. Now you're going to ask God, Lord, make me a profitable servant. Help me to be profitable. 
Help me to be profitable, oh God. Help me to be profitable, Lord. I want to be profitable. Some of our prayers annoy God. When you come back again to collect, meanwhile, the one he gave you before, you have not done anything. I know it annoys God because if you read Matthew 25, you see the tone of Jesus in that place. He wasn't sounding happy or excited. He was upset. How come I've traveled for these years, these months, and at the end of the day, you have nothing to show me. You have no soul. You have no disciple. You have no nation you are bringing. Meanwhile, others in the kingdom with less resources are coming to say concerning this area, the kingdoms of our God. It is now the kingdoms of our God. Who can you bring to say this one? This is now the kingdoms of our God. Now the third thing we're going to pray, we're going to ask God for strategy. Say, God, give me strategy. Give me divine strategy and he will bring it. As he draws things in your mind, write it down. Give me, oh God, strategy for profitability, oh God. Strategy. Your encounter is totally ineffective if it does not translate into business and expansion of the kingdom. If it does not translate to expansion, it is an ineffective and unproductive encounter. You will sound exactly like Jacob. Oh God, the days of my years have been few and have been evil. What do you do after an encounter with the Lord? After the encounter, Jacob went and served 20 years for women and for his business. We're going to ask God, Lord, give me strategy. Lord, give me strategy. What do I do on a daily basis? Oh God, give me strategy. The purpose of seeing the angels is for profit. The purpose of seeing cloud. The purpose of feeling the fire. The purpose of everything. It is at the end of the day that the kingdom of God be enlarged. That the kingdom of God be enlarged. That souls come into the kingdom. That souls come. That they are disciples. That they are growing in the Lord. That is the purpose. That is the purpose. Tell the Lord, oh God. Let me tell you why there is an encounter. God wants you to know that he's real. So that when you represent him, you will not be talking about somebody you had. You'll be talking about somebody you know. You'll be talking about somebody you know. That is the reason for the encounter. The encounter is not an end. It is a means to an end. It's not an end. It is a means to an end. There are men who are 13 already bringing results. There are people who are 17, they are already bringing results. There are men at 21, they are already bringing results. They are already surrendering their campuses to Jesus. There are people on campus that are already bringing the harvest of their campus to the feet of the master. There are people that are in secondary school, they are already bringing the results of an harvest of their secondary school. There are people that are bringing hospitals to Jesus. There are people that are bringing their streets to Jesus. There are men and women bringing women to Jesus. There are people bringing men to Jesus. Which one are you bringing to Jesus? What is God doing with your money? What is he doing with the things that you give him? Nothing. The only thing that God takes are two. One is worship. The other is the lives of men. If you really want to thank God, bring souls to him. If you really want to bless God, give him nations. Give him nations. Give him nations. Give him nations. Give him souls. Give him men that are disciples. Nobody can say he doesn't have a job. Nobody can say he doesn't have a job because there's a job. There's a kingdom job. And the best kind of employment is when you're employed by the kingdom. Father, we honor you today. We give you praise in the name of Jesus. Now we're going to ask for an empowerment as we go to the communion table. The Lord will empower us with whatever it is that we need. He will empower us with whatever, whatever it is that we need for the assignment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He's going to empower you for whatever you need. If he has dropped his strategy, write it down.